confirmation of this award today, on March 6, 2024, coincides with what will have been or marked Papa Chip Awolowa's 115th birthday and 37 years since his passing. I guess with that, I can lift my eyes towards heaven and say, Happy birthday, Papa. May Chief Obafemi Awolowa's soul continue to rest in peace even as we draw inspiration, inspiring lessons from his life, his policies, and philosophy. I have received several global awards by God's grace, for which I am very, very deeply grateful. But receiving the Awolowa Prize for Leadership is particularly very special. That's because it brings back to me personal memories. Growing up in old western region of Nigeria in the 1960s, only one name was synonymous with people-centered development, Awolowo. We lived in the same community with, as the sage, in Okebola in Ibadan. As a young child, passing by the frontage of his house was my favorite pastime. I remember peering over its low walls to see if I could catch it just a glimpse of the man who transformed the lives of millions in Western region. My father was so enamored with Chief Awolowo, or by Chief Awolowo, he devoured his books, writings, and articles. The name Awolowo was a constant guidepost for every discussion in our home. So much was my admiration that when I was 19 years old and Chief Awolowo ran for president, on that Unity Party of Nigeria in 1979. My friend and a, myself and a close friend of mine, and I think that friend you can understand is Dr. Oladoku, who has been the moderator of this event. We came all the way from University of Ife. We wanted to catch a glimpse of him as he addressed people in Lagos. When we arrived at Tafabalewa in Square in Lagos, the stands and the grounds were packed to capacity. The gates were locked, but we were absolutely undeterred. We had traveled all the way from Ife and will not be denied. And so we climbed the tall steel gates of the square, an unbelievable height actually, if you think about it, when I look at it today. Once we scaled through, we ran up close to the stage where he was speaking from and proudly stood just one arm's length from him and his dear wife, Mama Hana Dideolu Awolowo. Just a glimpse was enough. We listened with rapt attention to the exposition of his plans for Nigeria. We were mesmerized. Like a fragrance, his words took our breath away. We could smell hope in the air. Hope that Nigeria will be great. Hope that education will be free at all levels. Hope that there will be health for all. Hope that the remarkable transformation witnessed in Western region of Nigeria in education, in agriculture, in health and infrastructure, undergirded by a highly professional and disciplined civil service, will soon take hold all across Nigeria. Like the refrains of an orchestra, the sounds of owl, owl fill the air. As our hopes were raised, we could see a new Nigeria. Alas, this was not to be. Nigeria means its best opportunity to be great under President Awolowo. Chief Emeka Ojuku said of him, the best president that Nigeria never had. Let me say today very clearly that Chief Awolowo was bigger than Nigeria. He was the pace maker, the pace setter, the front runner for development in Africa. His intellectual capacity, vision, pragmatic social welfareism, 
helped him to accomplish what was seemingly unimaginable at the time. He built the first skyscraper in Africa, the Coco House. He built the first television station in Africa, WNTV. He built the Liberty Stadium, the first of its kind in Africa. He implemented a blueprint for development that focused on building human capacity through massive programs to educate people, develop skills and lift people out of poverty, provide massive infrastructure, and develop institutions that turn farmers into wealthy entrepreneurs. I dare say that Chief Aulowo implemented the Sustainable Development Goals decades before that phrase was coined. He was an inspiration for Africa, far beyond the shores of Nigeria. His philosophy, Awoism, was studied globally and helped shape programs and policies in other countries. And talking of other countries, I just have two people I want to just mention. Uh, Chair Gumede, please, from South Africa. Uh, please, Juju, also from South Africa. Please rise. You will recognize him as being in the parliament in South Africa. Thank you for being here. Today, Your Excellencies, my lecture is titled, Making a New Nigeria, Welfareist Policies and People-Centered Development. From my early days, I was influenced by the same drive as Chief Awolowo. I promised myself then that if I ever got into any position at all, I will run welfareist and people-centric policies. My heartbeat has always been about people, nothing more and nothing less. My life is only as useful to the extent that it is used of God to do my utmost to transform the lives of people. Awo inspired me. Decades ago, the perfume of building hope dropped off on me. It's a fragrance that still lingers on today. So, as I stand here before you today, to receive the Obafemi Awolowo Prize for Leadership, I am humble. I am inspired. And I am motivated. I feel a new sense of responsibility. I'm reminded today of the words of Martin Luther King Jr. History has thrust upon me a responsibility from which I cannot turn away. Yes, I have a dream of a better and prosperous Nigeria just like every single one of you here today. Yes, I have a dream for a globally respected Africa. Yes, I have a dream that Africa will not be condemned to the bottom rungs of the global economic ladder. I refuse to accept poverty's imprint on Africa. I still believe that Nigeria will rise again. And I still believe that Africa will shine and fulfill its destiny globally. I still believe that we shall be who we were meant to be. Today, I accept this prize as a trustee of hope for millions of our people. You bestow upon me this honor, this great honor, at a momentous period of great global challenges, from rising debt, climate change, fragilities, and vulnerabilities. Your honor. It's a call to do more amidst these challenges. So therefore, I celebrate but with measure. As I know with all humility that the work of making Nigeria great and by implication making Africa great is still in progress. It is my lifelong mission by the special grace of God to do all I can to improve the lives of all Africans. The wind of challenges may sometimes shift us away 
from our destined path, I'll be momentarily, but we shall overcome our challenges. Nigeria must dream. Africa must dream. Yes, we may have challenges, so do other people around the world. Yet, all I see tells me that by God's grace, we will get there. We must start by unleashing our potential, our full potential. While managing our challenges, we must make poverty history in Nigeria. And we must make poverty history in Africa. We will now be known as the Museum of Poverty in the world. We must deliver a better Nigeria and a better Africa for this generation and for generations to come. Given the high level of poverty in Africa and in Nigeria and in other countries, what is needed are welfareist policies that exponentially expand opportunities for all, reduce inequalities, improve the quality of life of people. These must be anchored on public-centric policies and private sector wealth creation for all. I would like to focus on five areas. First, rural economic transformation and food security. Second, healthcare security for all. Third, education for all. Fourth, access to affordable housing for all. And fifth, government accountability and fiscal decentralization for a true federalism. First, Nigeria must completely transform its rural economies to ensure food security for all. A better Africa must start with the transformation of our rural economies. And that is because 70% of our population live right there. Rural poverty today is extremely high. And at the heart of transforming rural economies is agriculture, the main source of their livelihoods. When agriculture moves away from being a way of life to a business, everything changes. Higher incomes, higher wages from agribusiness will support education and health and support even greater job creation for millions of youths. As a young student who attended high school in a village, I remember when I went to the village school, the great school, but it wasn't a village. I went to Igbo Baptist High School, fantastic school. And I remember asking my father, why you went to Igbo College? Why did you send me to a village school? He looked at me and he said, I don't know what you are going to ever be in life. But if you live in a village and you understand the challenges of poor people, if God ever makes you anybody important in life, you will know exactly what to do. I witnessed in that school, in the village, the high correlation of agricultural performance with education. Several of my classmates, and many of them are here today, and thank you for coming, my classmates, were children of farmers. I noticed then that when agriculture season was good, they stayed in school. They performed well in school. But when the season was poor and agriculture did not perform, several of them dropped out of school or attended intermittently. The decision by Chief Obafemi Awolowo to start with the transformation of the rural economy was a very, very sound policy. The establishment of farm estates, the expansion of farm rural roads, rural farm roads, supported professionally by well-run marketing boards, helped to stabilize the prices of farm produce. It's worth noting, Your Excellencies, that the prudent fiscal management of the cocoa revenues power the economies of the states that then constituted the Western region. These revenues allow the government to embark on an unprecedented idea, an audacious idea, free education and free basic health care services. It was common then to hear the phrase, Agbeloba, farmers are kings, uttered with great pride. 
We must give new life to our rural areas. If Chief Aulo could do this in the 1960s, then there is no reason why rural economies today should be immersed in extreme poverty. Clearly, rural economies have been abandoned in most places, in planning and in terms of policies. Today, they have become zones of economic misery. The popularization of rural economies it was causing the implosion of many countries and fragilities across Africa. When rural economies, the fulcrum of African society, falter, nations falter. This leads to the spread of anarchy, banditry, and terrorism. This trioka of social disruption takes advantage of economic misery to entrench themselves. Transformation of rural economies must therefore be structural, systemic, strategic, and comprehensive. Doing so means agriculture must be turned into a wealth-creating sector. I aggressively pursued this policy when I served as Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development in Nigeria from 2011 to 2015. Many call this period the farm revolution years as Nigeria witnessed an impressive transformation in its agricultural sector. With farmer-centric policies, we delivered improved seeds and fertilizers for 15 million farmers. We delivered millions of cocoa seedlings across southern Nigeria. We delivered a cotton transformation across the north. We provided millions of oil palm seedlings for farm estates, including small farmers and large farmer estates across the east, south, and the west. And I remember I was even challenged, why are you giving away oil palm seedlings for free? And I said, once you plant the tree, you can't export it. We accelerated the delivery of improved rice seed across Nigeria and sparked a rice revolution that transformed several regions across Nigeria. You have the governor. Governor, can you please stand? Please clap for governor. Please kindly sit down. I didn't know him until I came to give a talk, a lecture at the Business Day Forum. And I didn't know it was the same person that walked into my office. And your rice was called Damodi rice, I think, Your Excellency. My wife, when I was minister, she went to every market, buying every kind of new rice that was coming out as our policies were in operation. She said, honey, this is the new rice. This is the new rice. This is the new rice. Please thank you for thanking my wife, but I can tell you, I cannot be who I am today without her. It's no possible. And I wish my boss was here, my boss is still here, Vice President Sambo. I used to tell my president, President Goodluck Jonathan, that if I, when I came to the Federal Executive Council, it's not possible for me to present a memo that would be rejected. And he said, why? I said, because my memos go through a grace test at home. If it can pass Grace's test, it sadly can pass a test anywhere. And that has been the same in everything. Thank you, honey, for that. But anyway, she said, I found a new bag of rice, 5 kg, 10 kg bag of rice, and it's called Damodi rice. I've never heard of it. And I gave import quota for all the rice processors in the country to bring in rice, process the rice, make more money so they can begin to cultivate rice in Nigeria and then process rice in Nigeria. One of the young people that came into my office is now the governor of the state. So I didn't realize rice can make you so rich. Sound policies transform the lives of people. I found to remember one of my farm trips in company of the then governor of Kebbi State, His Excellency Usman Dakingari. Amazed by the revolution happening, I recall him saying to me, Minister, thank you for the government policies. 
we no longer measure our rice cultivation in hectares of land. We measure them in kilometers of land. Rice, rural economies boom, look at wild packet rice like that of Damodi rice that we talked about just now from the governor, took over the market. And I know that right here in Lagos, governor of Lagos State, in Itoki, is it? Itoki was. Imota, you set up a 2.5, uh, 2,500 ton capacity. Was it, has it grown? Yes. But that was what's called the, 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 the rise from Lagos. Uh, and, and so congratulations also. I think uh, rice can even make successful governors even more successful. The price of rice at the time was 6,000 naira a bag, which helped to stem food price inflation. Unfortunately today, the same bag of rice just nine years later, it's now 77,000 naira per bag. That 12-fold price increase unfortunately put rice, a basic staple beyond the reach of millions of people. In several parts of Africa today, prime revolutions are happening at scale with support of the African Development Bank. Permit me, please. You have heard a lot about me today. What I've done, additional did this, additional did that, additional accomplished that, but I don't walk alone. I have some of the very best staff that anybody else can ask for in the world. And I like all of my staff from the bank that are here. They are the ones that are the power behind the throne who actually make those things happen to stand and be recognized. Thank you very much. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Over the last seven years, we have invested over $8.5 billion in agriculture which has impacted 250 million people. At the core of the Africa-wide strategy to revamp rural economies and turn them into zones of economic prosperity is the development of special agro-industrial processing zones. These zones have been provided with critical supportive infrastructure, including water, roads, processing infrastructure, and logistics. The bank, and partners are providing $1.4 billion for these zones, 25 of them across 11 countries. And many of my partners are here today, including the Badia Bank. Thank you for being here. I know the AFC is here, uh, Africa 50 is here, and so many of the partners. Thank you very much for your partnership. Right here in Nigeria, Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, let me thank you for chairing the group for receiving Professor Banji Oyelara, my special advisor on industrialization in your office for countless hours to make sure that we can implement the $518 million project to do the development of these zones in eight states. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I want to tell you, Mr. Vice President, that we will not spare any effort to rally around the president, yourself, and this government to make sure we can get agriculture back again. And that's why we've decided that we will mobilize an additional $1 billion to make sure that these special agro-industrial processing zones will now be done in 28 states of the Federation of Nigeria. And Mr. Vice President, Together, myself, with other partners, including AfriExim Bank, Rama, we've just put together a $3 billion facility to do even more. And I want you to know that the times are challenging. But sometimes, Mr. Vice President, leaders like yourself come to this kind of location because you also need to be encouraged. And let me encourage you. I told Mr. President when I had the opportunity of seeing him on the 14th of February, which was the same day that the senior brother of my wife died, I went to see him. And when I spoke with him, 
Say, Mr. President, I understand you have challenges. That's okay. I'm not saying challenges are okay. But when there are issues, please don't leave leaders helpless. Rally around leaders. This is very important to do. I told him, as I'm speaking to you, we already have in the field. Dr. Pregene, can you stand up? It's my director for agriculture over there. <laughs> Vice President Beth on agriculture over there. And Dr. Tim Williams, Dr. Sanginga, my special envoys on agriculture, they are all here. I had them in, in the east, I mean in the north for two weeks as I speak to you, thanks to the support of all of our governors that are here. We have already supported with $134 million the cultivation of 118,000 hectares of heat-tolerant wheat. We will, by the grace of God, this month do 150,000 hectares of maize. And by this wet season that is coming, we will support the cultivation of 300,000 hectares of rice, 300,000 hectares of maize, 150,000 hectares of cassava, and 50,000 hectares of soybean. What that means, Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, is that we will be able, by the end of March, get at least a million hectares additional of wheat with four million metric tons of additional food coming. Please, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was asked by a journalist yesterday what I thought of the issues in Nigeria. And I said, as a person, I do not have the luxury of criticizing. My job is to support. My job is to find solutions. Let's all put our hands together. It's a collective responsibility, I have no doubt that we can get out of the situation that we are in. And to ensure that the continent can feed itself and achieve full sovereignty, we organized the Feed Africa Summit that High Excellency President Samia and also uh, the other presidents mentioned. 34 heads of state and government in a, in a meeting. And somebody asked me, are African heads of state committed to the policies that you are talking about, I say, yeah, they are. And I remember during the meeting, it was time for lunch, it was 3.30 p.m. And President Bio of Syria alone, I said, Your Excellency, it's time for lunch, but you got people in the investment boardrooms for your country. Will you choose to go for lunch, sir? We will do that. If you're so direct, he said, no. I would rather go into those with the other presidents in the investment boardrooms and figure out how we are going to feed our people. And thank you, Your Excellency, President Samia, President Asali, President of Togo, my dear brother Nasingbe, President of Ethiopia, and several other presidents, including President Buhari, who was there at the time. We were able, within 72 hours of that summit, we had mobilized with other partners that are here today, we had mobilized $30 billion in 72 hours. And in six weeks, we had mobilized $72 billion, as President Asali said to you. So I know that the issue of feeding Africa is one that we must do, and feed Africa we must do with pride, because there is no pride in begging for food. Second, Nigeria needs health for all. Smart governments provide universal basic health care coverage for their citizens. Africa loses today $2.6 trillion annually in terms of productivity due to sicknesses and diseases. Just as every nation has a national defense system to protect its citizens against all forms of aggression, the same is true for health care systems. A nation without a sound healthcare system is a nation that is defenseless against the invasion of all forms of diseases and pandemics. 
COVID-19 exposed the weakness of African economies on health systems. While developed economies spend $19 trillion on fiscal stimulus programs, approximately 19% of the global GDP, Africa spent only $89 billion. Africa's urgent need for vaccines was pushed to the bottom of the global supply chains. At the time when Africa was unable to provide one basic shot of vaccine, developed countries provided second shots, third booster shots, fourth shots, and fifth booster shots. It was alarming watching an unprotected Africa grapple with this insidious virus. Some even projected that as many as three million Africans were going to die as a result of this pandemic. Africa, just two testing centers. No medical gloves, no face masks, no medications, no vaccines. The African Development Bank Board agreed with us in management as we presented to them a $10 billion facility which we put in place to rapidly support countries to fight that pandemic. What is not acceptable or sustainable is that Africa imports today 70 to 80% of its medicines and produces only 1% of its vaccines. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the health security of 1.4 billion people in Africa cannot be subjugated again to global supply chains or the generosity of others. What if others are not so generous? And that's why the African Development Bank launched a $3 billion program to revamp Africa's pharmaceutical industries. And that's why we established what's called today the Africa Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation to support access to proprietary technologies from global pharmaceutical companies. That's why the African Development Bank launched another $3 billion to develop quality healthcare infrastructure across the continent with special emphasis on primary health care systems, which in fact, if you fix primary health care systems, you probably will fix 85% of all the challenges that you have in the healthcare sector. We will continue to invest heavily right here in Nigeria, support the revamping of the pharmaceutical industry, and develop better health infrastructure. It is imperative, therefore, that Nigeria secures the health of its population. This will require ensuring that no citizen travels more than a few kilometers to find a health care center. The widespread use of mobile health care centers, e-facilities, Dr. Adewara from London is here, she's a Nigerian, she's here, she's doing a phenomenal job in that particular area. The digitalization of health care system, Mr. Jitenda, of the uh, of Sazdeva is here somewhere, and I know they are doing great work in Kaduna. Especially primary health care centers, health insurance for all, including innovative micro health insurance payment systems, as you go systems, will capture the bulk of our population that is in the informal sector. Third, Nigeria needs education for all. Nigeria today accounts for 15% of the total population of out-of-school children, according to UNICEF, which is over 10.2 million at primary school, 8.1 million at junior secondary school. This is not a gold medal that Nigeria should be proud of. The problem is both acute and alarming in northern Nigeria. Urgent public policies coupled with community sensitization and incentives for schooling are badly needed if this trend is to be reversed. Public incentives such as free and compulsory primary and secondary education should be put in place. Yeah, if you want to clap for that, you can go ahead. Thank you. Along with massive investments in training and better salaries for teachers, building quality and safe classrooms and school feeding programs. Your Excellencies, a well-educated citizenry is critical for technological growth and development and for fostering creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, 
and global competitiveness. We do have a choice. We don't have a choice. A highly educated Nigeria is it's not an option for us not to have. It is an imperative to have a highly educated Nigeria. With only 1% of our population, however, enrolled in universities, we are not educating enough of our people at the university level. The poor funding of universities, a lack of basic infrastructure, poor incentives for faculty and staff, and incessant strikes due to weight disputes have almost tripled the university system. I would like to say here that I really commend His Excellency the President because I read and followed his decision to put in place programs for students to be able to have affordable loans for them going to go to universities. That is a good starting point and congratulations to the President. But as a result of all of this quagmire, there's a mass exodus out of Nigerian universities. With 129,000 Nigerian students um, I guess they do jackpine, which is the, I guess the, it's a phraseology for getting out of the country, we call it here. To study in the United Kingdom alone between 2015 and 2022, according to the Higher Education Agency of the United Kingdom. The mass exodus of students pales when compared to those of skilled professionals, from doctors to engineers, architects and lawyers, IT specialists, bankers, and medical technicians, Nigeria is witnessing a massive depletion of its human capital. This human capital hemorrhage will slow down economic growth, performance, and overall development and competitiveness of this economy. While one might argue that a growing diaspora is good, as they send back home billions of dollars, which is higher than the all revenue that we have, this is not the way to develop sustainably. Nations that develop do all they can to keep their best human capital at home and additionally source skills from elsewhere with flexible immigration and labor policies. We must make Nigeria a viable place for people to stay and not a place to run away from. The same applies to other countries. I refuse to believe that the future of Nigeria's and Africa's youth lie in Europe, North America, Asia, or anywhere else. I believe that their future must lie in an Africa growing well, robustly, able to create quality jobs and decent earnings for our young people. There's absolutely no reason in the world how we have a demographic asset that then becomes a global negative externality. Let's take pride in ourselves and let's make our demographic asset our economic asset globally. I firmly believe that their future lies right here in Nigeria. And that's why the African Development Bank launched right here, Mr. Vice President, in Nigeria, a program called IDIS, which you know, and in fact, you are chairing, ably chairing that committee on the IDIS a $640 million program to support Nigeria's digital and creative enterprises. And here are going to be the results. Please support the government in this. It will create 6.3 million jobs in this country. And it will add $6.4 billion to Nigeria's economy. To support Nigerian young people in businesses and African young people in businesses, for all the heads of state and government, I always say to myself, how can we have 477 million people under the age of 35? Well, there are no financial institutions for them. That means you have missing institutions and market failure problem. And that's why the African Development Bank decided that we will create what's called Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks. I go around many countries, and I'm told I have a youth empowerment program. That's OK. I have a youth empowerment program. That's OK. But rarely do I have young people that will come to me and say they've been empowered. So I ask them, I say, what's going on? Young people need investment. 
They need us to trust in their mind, their creativity, their entrepreneurship, ability to grow youth-based wealth. So this Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank, as you know, Mr. Vice President, we are going to our board this year for Nigeria, and it will be $400 million. We're doing for Tanzania. I was in Togo, we're doing for Togo. And also, we are doing uh, in, in, uh, Eth uh, in Ethiopia, I think, with the Ethiopian Bank. Let me reach my fourth point, and then I can close. I think we need housing for all. I don't want to bother you with more statistics, but I only want to say one thing so I don't keep you for too long. As a kid, I grew up in a neighborhood wherein we didn't have water and sanitation. And therefore, I remember when my father was able to build us a small house. In fact, it was not even a completed house. He built the first floor and we moved in. It wasn't even painted. But I was so pleased and I was so happy because for once in my growing up, I actually could have a place I could I call my own toilet. A place I could have my own bathroom. My friends were children of very rich people. But God gave me excellent parents that taught me great values. And I remember going around those neighborhoods and asking myself the question, why is it that we can't provide affordable housing for all? I was at a function one day, I was asked, why don't we upgrade all the slums? And I said, there is nothing called a five-star slum. A slum is a slum. And therefore, we must do everything possible through new financial instruments to make sure that every individual can have a decent home that they can call theirs. And I want to ask, Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, I know you've started a program on housing. And I know the governor of Lagos State in particular has a lot of work going on housing. Let's do more. Let's make sure we turn all those slums. We shouldn't have gold medal in slums. Let's make good homes for people. No more five-star slums. Let me conclude with my fifth point. Your Excellencies, Nigeria needs government accountability and fiscal decentralization for a true federalism. <laughs> Democracy is more than the right to cast a vote. It is the right of citizens to hold their governments accountable for improvements in their welfare. Citizens' accountability forums are needed in order to have a say in how their nation resources are being used and how their governments are performing. Governments must show concrete and transparent evidence of fiscal responsibility. Excellences, governments without citizen accountability become synonyms for democratic dictatorship. Today, therefore, there's a greater need for e-governance systems to enhance transparency and accountability of governments and the service of the people. That is what people-centered governance is all about. And that's why the African Development Bank is supporting the creation of quality of service delivery indices all across Africa. Development clearly requires a significant amount of money, financing. A primary tool for that is taxation. The rationale for raising taxes in Nigeria is that the nation's tax to GDP ratio is low compared to other African and non-African countries. However, taxation in the absence of a social contract between the government and citizens is simply fiscal extortion. Participatory tax-based financing systems demand participatory governance. Take the case of Norway, for instance. Its tax-to-GDP ratio is 39%. It 
It's easy, therefore, to make the comparison and say that Nigeria needs to raise its taxes to GDP ratio from 6.1% of GDP to a similar level like in Norway. Yes, you can make that point economically. But consider this, that in Norway, like other Nordic countries, education is free through university level. And if you finish your course on time, any loans you took to feed yourself, clothe yourself, or maintain yourself are converted into grants. We must therefore distinguish between nominal taxes and implicit taxes. Taxes that people pay that are borne by the citizens but are not seen or are not recorded. Should be told, Nigeria and several other countries pay one of the highest implicit tax rates in the world. That's because most citizens provide their own electricity for themselves, via generators, to repair roads in their own neighborhoods because they can't, if they can't afford to do that. They provide boreholes for drinking water in their own homes. This is 21st century. This is incredulous, as I believe that every household should have pipe-born water. Sadly, the abnormal has been normalized. If people pay taxes, governments must deliver citizens the services and be held accountable for their ability to do so or not. Governments should not transfer their responsibility to citizens. When governments or institutions fail to provide basic services, the people bear the burden of a heavy implicit tax. To succeed with much needed welfare risk and people-centered policies across Nigeria as espoused by Papa Awolowo, it is necessary to change the governance system and decentralize governance to the states in order to provide greater autonomy. States that have tremendous potential, have po tremendous potential to become even more financially autonomous through greater fiscal prudence. If states focus on unlocking the huge resources they have based on their areas of comparative advantage, they will rapidly expand wealth for their people. With such increased wealth, they will be able to access capital markets and secure long-term financing to fast-track their growth and development. States that adopt this strategy will have less need for monthly trips to Abuja for grants. Instead, part of their federal revenue allocations can be saved as internal sub state sovereign wealth funds. And these can be used as guarantees against borrowing from capital markets. In essence, they will be free from needing to exclusively rely on the federal government. To get out of the economic quagmire, there is a compelling need for the restructuring of Nigeria. Restructuring, however, should not be driven by political expediency, but by economic and fiscal viability. Economic and fi financial viability are the necessary and sufficient conditions for political viability. If there was one attribute that defines Chief Obafemi Awolowo, and there were many, it would be his visionary boldness. He went where others feared or failed to go. In the process, decades later, his footprints remain in the sands of time. Likewise today, in Nigeria, we need men and women with vision who are willing to take bold decisions. Surgeries are tough. They are better done well the very first time. The resources found in each state and state groupings should belong, in my view, to them. The constituent entities should pay federal taxes or royalties for those resources. But let's be clear, the achievement of economically viable entities and the viability of the national entity requires constitutional changes to devolve more economic and fiscal powers to states and the regions. The stronger the states or the regions, the stronger the federation units are going to be. In the process, our union will be renewed. Our union will be stronger. Our union will be equitable. 
our union will be fully participatory. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we must be audacious. Instead of a federal government of Nigeria, we could think of United States of Nigeria. The old will give way to the new. We will change the relation and mindset between the states and Abuja. The fulcrum will be the states, while the center will support them, not lord over them. With good governance and better accountability systems, and a zero tolerance for corruption, more economically stronger constituent states will emerge. We will unleash massive wealth all across the states, working together. A new Nigeria will arise. To do so, we need all of us, not some of us. From our forgotten rural villages, to our boisterous and dynamic urban areas, from the sparks of desire and the eyes of our children, to the lingering hope in the hearts of our youth, from the yearnings of our women and mothers, and our fathers and our men for a better tomorrow, and the desires of the old that our end will be better than our past. From the hard-working street vendors and small businesses to the largest business conglomerates, we must create a movement of hope. Hope for a better Nigeria. Not a Muslim Nigeria. Not a Christian Nigeria. Not Eastern Nigeria. Western Nigeria. Northern Nigeria or Southern Nigeria. But one Nigeria, a new Nigeria, created by renewed commitment to turn our amazing diversity into our exceptional strength. A new Nigeria, powered by torrents of hope, trust, equity, fairness, and wealth at every level in every state, by all and for all. We have the capacity to do this and make it happen. We must rise above mistrust and divisions and make history. Not the history that is written about us, about Northern Nigeria, Southern Nigeria, Eastern Nigeria, or Western Nigeria. No, not the history of divisive political parties but a new history that we commit to write for ourselves, the history of a new Nigeria. We are the history makers. So let us collectively commit to make history for a new Nigeria. The darkness of today will soon fade. It will not be long before our star shines brighter as a nation. As welfare policies and people-centered policies as espoused by Papa Wolo, which I believe strongly in, spoil shared wealth. A nation where a majority prosper, not just a privileged few. A nation that provides real opportunities for the youth. A nation where equality of opportunities for women is a reality, not a dream. A nation where hope is ignited and dreams are realized. A nation known for wealth, not poverty. A nation set on a hill whose light will never be hidden. A new Nigeria we all can collectively call home. So help us God, and I thank you very much.